Louis Shelton may not be a household name, but you definitely know the songs that bear his signature guitar riffs. With a career that started with the Monkees' last train to Clarksville, Louis went on to become the guy that has played on more hit records than any other session guitarist in history. I don't even know where to start when it comes to his credits, so I'm going to roll a selection down the side here and say some of my favourites include the riffs he played for the Jackson 5 and the guitar solo in Hello by Lionel Richie. It's fair to say that Louis played on nearly every record my parents listened to when I was a kid, except for the Beatles and Bohemian Rhapsody. Louis going to be joining me regularly for more videos here on my channel, including more interviews with him, some of his friends, to even helping me out on the odd product demo now and then. So if you haven't subscribed and hit the notification bell yet, I invite you to do so to keep up to date with new videos as they come out. So make yourself comfortable and enjoy as I kick off the conversation with Louis by introducing him to a friend's 1952 Fender Telecaster, just like the one he played as Little Junior Shelton in Little Rock, Arkansas. So we were chatting a couple of weeks ago when I, I asked you about what your first guitar was. Yeah. And uh, what was your first guitar? Well, my very first guitar was a Stella and the strings were about that high off the neck. <laughs> and uh, I was nine years old. Okay. And over the next few years, I went from uh, a $13 Stella to a $20 Harmony and uh, eventually got up to one of the first Telecasters. Uh -huh. So a 52 was what you told me, yeah? I believe it was a 52. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually believe I got it in 53. Okay. From a little music store in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. It was sitting in the window there. and yeah. So right beside you, I've actually got a reissue 1952 uh -huh. Telecaster. So, yeah, pick up and have a bit of a look at that. Is that anything like your original guitar? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, they're so sleek. And I, I can remember when I first got one, it was like going from a crop duster to a stealth fighter. Yeah, yeah. But they're just so sleek and uh, the action is so low. Okay. And um, uh, it's just a totally different feel for than any other guitar. So that one actually belongs to a student of mine. Uh, and I think it's just a cheapie, but I actually have, over there in the spare room, a real 1952 Telecaster. And I'm gonna go grab oh, that for you right now. You're kidding. I've got one right over here, mate. Oh man. This one feels awful good. So oh. this here belongs to a friend of mine, a local guy. And it is a genuine Hang 1952 on Fender Telecaster, and that's worth a lot of money. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's, it's lighter. It's lighter? Oh, you notice it's lighter, lighter straight away? That. Yeah. Yeah. This might be mine. I've been looking for it for many years. Yeah. 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 No, I've got a lot of people, a lot of my family in Arkansas are looking for my original. Really? For yeah. Telly. Man, that's seen some use, hasn't it? Oh, it's great guitar. Now, I also have here a 1952 Deluxe mm -hmm. Tweed. What do you say we plug it in and have a bit of a listen? Oh, that'd be great, I've got yeah. The cable right here, mate. Boy. What a sound. Does that. Does that feel like your own guitar from what you remember? It does, yes. Yeah? Yeah. Of course, I was a. That yeah. was Little Junior Shelton back in those days. Okay. Yeah. So your first electric, your 52, who bought that for you? Uh, Did you pay for that? Your parents bought it for you? I joined a band that uh, almost uh, a gentleman and his wife, they were like my second parents. Yeah. They kind of adopted me for a couple of years because I was a young, poor kid in Little Rock, but they thought I had some potential. They had a radio show five days a week, and then they played it this Saturday night jamboree called the Barnyard Frolics in Little Rock. They had me join their band, and they're the ones that took me to this little music store in Pine Bluff and had me pick out uh, uh, the guitar and an amp. The amp was bigger, than, a little bigger than that one. Sure, sure. I'm not sure what model it was. Okay. And uh, I kept that amp 
until the basements came out, and then I, I traded it for a basement. Cool, cool. Uh, that would have been in about 58, I believe, I, I traded for the basement. Yeah? Yeah, 58 or 59, somewhere around there. And what, what inspired you to get the Telecaster? Um, this uh, Saturday night jamboree, there was a guy that came there, uh, a performer. Uh, his name was Jimmy Lee a very good entertainer, singer, and uh, he had a, the first Telecaster I ever saw. Yeah? Yeah, so uh, I thought, man, that guitar was made for me. Yeah. And uh, uh, so that's that was the first one I ever saw, and, and the one that I bought was the second one that I ever saw. Uh, <clears throat> of course, <clears throat> one of my favorite guitar players, Jimmy Bryant, that's what he was famous for, playing the Telecaster. Okay, yeah. And... Uh, I, I learned a lot from listening to him, the the fast single note picking. Uh, yep, he was my favorite. My my first uh, idol was Chet Adkins, and I I learned Chet Adkins stuff first. And I learned by listening to records and the radio. Uh, never had any formal lessons or anything. Sure. I mean, I I, I use his technique. Uh, that tune I used to use uh, uh, a lot of Chet Atkins style to, to to just develop my chops for finger picking yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, I've heard uh, Tommy Emmanuel, who's really into the, yeah. the whole style, refer to as boom chick. Boom oh yeah, chick, boom chick. it's 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 sort of like having the bass and the drum, the bass the, and a snare drum. Just... And then you add them. Into the... But yeah, Chet, uh, he had such a wide range of guitar stuff. Uh, as for a kid from Arkansas like me, that uh, you know, a Chet actually he did a lot of uh, classical stuff. Yeah. That, and uh, in the South, we mostly heard country stuff, but Chet exposed us to a lot of different kind of stuff. Did you ever meet Chet? Oh yeah, I met Chet when I was twelve. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, ran on to him for several. Uh, every once in a while, I'd run on to him throughout our whole lifetime. Yeah, yeah. And I was actually with him uh, just a few months before he passed away. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we kept in touch. Uh, I went to see him in Las Vegas one time when he was traveling with Boots Randolph and uh, Floyd Kramer, uh, yakety yakety sax guys. Okay. You know? Yep. They were doing a concert at, at Harrah's in uh, Vegas. And I went back after the show, and Chet played uh, a half an hour for me, just a, like a private concert really? of stuff he was working on. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, that that was something I'll never forget. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, yeah. cool. But so, whatever happened to your telly? Uh, you know, around uh, I got well, around fifty five, fifty six. I started doing more Chuck Berry and some jazz, so I traded it up for more uh, a solid, uh, for a hollow body guitar. Okay, yeah. And uh, and then I left Arkansas and, you know, eventually ended up in California. Yeah. 
So uh, I never saw my telly again. Do and you regret selling it? I do. You do? Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, worth a bit now, huh? It, it would be, but, uh, you know, it would be uh, just nice to have. Uh, yeah. Because, uh, you know, uh, it would be just as good today, if not better, than it was back in 52 yeah. uh, when yeah. I had it. Yeah. Uh, I do have a reissue, uh, a copy that the guys in Nashville fixed up for me, a 52 reissue. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's uh, as close to what I think the original would be like if yep. I could find it. Yeah. Very much like this one, you yep. know. Now, uh, one thing to point out on the old 52s is it doesn't have Phillips head screws. Uh-huh. They've got just the uh, the flat blade oh, yeah, head right, screws yeah. because it was before... Uh-huh. Uh, Phillips heads became popular. Right, yeah. Uh, did you always have the ashtray cape, yeah. ashtray cover? It did, yeah. yeah. Did that uh, stay I'll on or did you take no, it off? No, I took it yeah. off. Yeah, it seems everyone took I them mean, off. I mean, you huh? got to choke the string up here. Yeah. Yeah, we all took them off. Uh, it's very light. I can't get over how light it is. Mm, mm. Yeah. So one thing with the original Telecasters, and this one's been modified since, but, and we talked about this the other night, the neck position on here actually was the neck pickup with all the treble rolled off. This one doesn't have that. The reissue beside you does have that, and it's quite an interesting sound. I don't remember mine having that. You don't? I don't remember that uh, being an overly bassy front pickup. Sure, sure. The reissue right beside you does. Uh-huh. Have, have a little play of that and, and have a listen. Okay. Yeah. And I'll hold on to this one. Yeah, that's the rolled off sound. You don't remember yours sounding like that? Nah. Yeah, that's very pillowy sound. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you this one again, mate. I'd love to hear you play that. But whereabouts were you were you gigging when you had your 52? Uh, in Arkansas. Yep. All over the state. Yep. We, uh, uh, Main, mainly in Little Rock and Pine Bluff, but we all we did gigs all over the little towns in Arkansas. Yeah. yeah. Is there any recordings out there of you playing it? Uh, there's. I came across one the other night on YouTube. Um, Shelby Cooper. Uh, he was the guy who bought me the guitar before I left their group. We did a couple of little forty-five records, and and there, there's a couple on there with with my solos when I was like twelve or thirteen years cool. old. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So you you were you were quite a good player, quite young. Oh yeah, I was featured solo player in the band. I, yeah. I did a lot of uh, uh, did Chet Adkins tunes, did some of the Jimmy Bryant tunes. Yeah. And uh, I, I used to do a tune called uh, "Picking the Chicken." It started. <laughs> you know. That kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. <laughs> I hadn't played that in 50 years, but that's what I used to play as a, as little Junior Shelton. Little Junior yeah. Shelton. Yeah. Great. Uh-huh. Of course, the first tune most a lot of us learned was... That's how Mother Maybell the Carter played it. And then Chad Atkins, he came in. With his chops. Man, that is just so different to anything <laughs> that I play. I'm just fascinated by people who played like that. You know, all the, I know hard rock and metal kind of playing, and I see that, I go, yeah. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> that is so cool. That's so cool. I uh, know. It's a, uh, a bygone era of music. You yeah, know? yeah. Well, they call that Travis picking or something, right? There's well, few different... Merle Travis, uh, he, he was one of the first that did that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then he'd sing along with it. But Chet developed it. Uh, to a much finer degree with with his uh, instrumentals, uh, yeah, 
over the years, he, you know, had so many albums and such a variety of stuff that he did. If I had my thumb pick, I could play you some real Chet Atkins stuff. Yeah, but unfortunately, I, I don't I have one here, that. mate. It's not something I, I, I yeah, carry around. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, uh, what you were playing was almost a little banjo inspired, that, that first thing you played before. Like, do you play banjo? I don't play banjo, but, well, I mean, I do play a little bit. I've got a five string, but uh, I don't call myself a banjo player. Yeah. I, I worked out the, this, uh, and again, I need my thumb pick, but I, I worked out this. <laughs> Was the old Beverly cool. Hillbilly sings. Who played that? Do you know? Uh, Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs yeah. were, were the writers. And, okay. Uh, yeah. They, they were on the Grand Ole Opry in the, you know, in the old days. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Great piece of music. Hey, I, I just <laughs> love hearing you play that thing. That's, and even this, this is yeah. a genuine 52. Yeah. It's, it's not that loud. Was yours very loud? Uh, you know, we didn't play as loud in those days no, because, no. like in the studio, we had one mic in the center of the room, yeah. and whoever sang would be closest. I'd have my amp over there, the fiddle player would step up there, the bass player. So we had to position ourselves and balance ourselves in the room like yeah, that yeah. with one mic. Yeah, you know, it's one thing I notice when I, when I check out, like, say, old Buddy Holly videos and stuff is uh -huh. they're not singing into a microphone, man. There's they, they must have a, what, an overhead yeah, or something. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, they did. Even on our TV show, yeah. they did. Yeah. yeah. A big boom. Yeah. Yeah. But those guys would have to really project. But not then like for all those years in the clubs and our live stuff, there was the only person that had a mic was a singer. The rest of the band, they weren't mic'd yeah. or anything. Yeah, yeah. It's just if you're going to do a fill so you step up to the mic, you know. Yeah. And if you're doing a guitar solo, you turn it up for that bit, you yeah. know. Must have sounded horrible off stage, but that's the way it was. But that's people were more into well, we weren't balance. playing. You're we playing weren't playing yourself. as big a rooms either. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? We weren't playing for sixty thousand. Uh, like when I saw Elvis, uh, he was in our little high school room, and it wouldn't have held more than two hundred people. So you saw Elvis in high school? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Really? Well, he came to our little high school in Pine Bluff. Wow. When he first started. Just like, so he wasn't a big name? He was still... Oh, no, he just released his first record. Wow. It was him and Scotty Moore and, and Bill Black, the bass player, yeah. before they had a drummer. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And did you think he'd go on to be as big as he did when you saw him? Did you go, man, that guy's got it? Or... Oh, yeah. 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 Because uh, it didn't take long. He, he busted through, you know. I yeah. mean, uh, the next time I saw him was at the big auditorium where we had our Saturday night jamboree. Yeah. And because they knew me there, I got to go backstage and hang out with him and yeah. stuff. Yeah, cool. And, you hung out with And Elvis. by that time, he was, it was like the Beatles, you know. Yeah. Girls going crazy trying to get in and yeah. all that stuff, you know. I remember seeing his pink Cadillac parked out the back there. You really? Know? Yeah. Where where the artist entrance was on this behind yeah. the stage, yeah. you know. How old would, would Elvis have been? Um, he he was he would have been around twenty, I would say, yeah. nineteen or twenty. Okay. Yeah, and I believe he, he was nineteen the first time I saw him. Yeah, right. Yeah, he right. definitely uh, shook the world a bit, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Shook the world, shook his pelvis. Yeah, <laughs> and died young, way too yeah, young. Yeah, yeah. Now, did we talk about why the Telecaster? Like, you said there was somebody that was out, out there playing a Telecaster that you saw. Yeah, I yeah. mentioned this guy, Jimmy Lee, yeah. was the first guy I saw playing one. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't that he, uh, he was a great showman, uh, I remember, for that day, because most of the singers just got up and boringly sang their song. And yeah. he, he actually moved around a little bit and got down on his knees and doing some stuff. And so was it considered like very futuristic when you saw one of these? Did oh, you yeah. see that and just go, oh. whoa, what is oh, that? Oh, my God, yeah. It was, uh, well, if you can imagine going 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 from those Stella guitars to something like this. It, yeah. Yeah, it was very futuristic, Yeah. And felt just felt so sleek, yeah. you know. Yeah. You'd never, 
you'd never felt anything like that, you know? Yep. I can still remember the smell of the guitar case that oh, really? I had. Yeah. Had that crushed velvet lining in it, red velvet lining in it or yep. something like that. Amazing guitar. I put a Bigsby on mine. Did you? Yeah. I okay. screwed it up really bad. Ah! <laughs> well, that'll make it easy to find. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it definitely, um, something else I did. You see how that's cut away there? Yeah. I cut it away like that, too, up here. Okay. Well, it's in one of my photos. Yeah, you right. You see okay. that. Yeah. yeah. How did you do that? Just uh, by hand? A, a saw and a, a wood file. Yeah. Yeah, by hand. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I did it by hand. Leo almost got it right the first time, didn't he? With with the Telecaster, but I mean, the second time being the, the Strat. He almost got it right with the shape and everything. Well, they're two different guitars, though. They sound different. They do, everything. don't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're two different animals. I never was a, really a Strat guy. No? No, I never yeah, was. Yeah, it's your Strat that's in the, the Hall of Fame, right? It is a Strat, yeah. yeah. But I have I have a few Strats. Yeah. But uh, for some reason, these are just more stable as far as staying in tune and, sure. and, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. On one of my Strats... Uh, it's it's really very highly customized. Yeah. It's got the last original Floyd Rose on it. It has a Seymour Duncan 59 for the bridge pickup, yeah. Yeah. which is a humbucker. The full humbucker size. It was wired by Dan Armstrong, who's a bit of an inventor. He put the five-way switch, which it's all combinations of pickups, you know, okay, and yeah. all that stuff. It has a custom bird's eye maple neck on it, so it's very highly customized. Yeah, got the the lockdown yeah. nut up at the top. From this angle here, man, there is some serious gouge marks from from picking over the years. Yeah, on that just up here, the way uh -huh. I was looking at it. Yeah, and even through here. Yeah, how old is that? Fifty-two. Is that sixty? 67 yeah, years old. Yeah, it's a 67-year-old yeah, yeah, guitar. Yeah, right. So I can see here, it's ash was the, the wood they used back then. You can just see how it's all mm -hmm. sunken into the ash that yeah. they finished. It looks like there's almost just a little bit of a cigarette, cigarette stain because yeah, yeah. that's where, where we used to put the cigarette yep. when we yep. smoked. But uh, that's a pretty good neck. The, the whole logo is still on there really well. He doesn't clean the fretboard very often though, right? That dirt. It doesn't look like it, does it? It doesn't yeah. look it. Now, I noticed on yours that you had around the other day, just the, the wear on it, it's not the same, is it, when you get relics, the, the relic jobs? Mine, they probably overdid it just a little bit with taking all of all of the finish yeah. off. Yeah, but you can see on the newer ones where they take away the finish, it's clean underneath, whereas that, you can see it's... Yeah, this is very similar to mine. There's not that much fretware. Well, I those assume are nice been, frets. Yeah, so. I assume that's been refretted over the years. Oh, they, they're very nice. Can't even feel them around the edge. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. It's got that whole rolled edge feel, but that would be natural just from uh -huh. being played in. Yeah. I sure like the sound of it. <laughs> Tell you what, Louis. It'd take me all of two minutes to stick a mic on that and just let you play for a bit. That'd be okay? Just uh -huh. to, to get the, the proper yeah. sound? Yeah.
<laughs> you got quite a long reach. I just noticed in one of those passages well, before. Is... Yeah, look at that. I was really proud when I learned how to do that. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, literally, you have to be, you know, uh, to play classical guitar, there's a reason why they teach you to hold it yeah. uh, like this, because, you know, it's not like you can play this. You really have to, you really have to be in that. Uh... If you want to play it right. Yeah. Is that something you got into later on in life, or did you always play classical guitar? I uh, I always uh, had had the uh, you know the Segovia records and Carlos Montoya, flamenco player, and I listened to all any kind of guitar stuff, you yep. know. Uh, and of course, uh, I would I would have favorites that I well that sounds great. I'd love to learn how to play that, yep. you know. Yeah. So I would pick a few of them to, uh, like this this Bach thing. I play music with other people. When someone gives me a guitar and says, hey, play me something, I've got nothing. I've got nothing. I don't know solo pieces. You know, yeah, yeah, hey, right. I'll, I'll strum you some, some campfire type guitar, but I just don't have but pieces. When you, get, when you get going, you respond to what you're hearing. If Absolutely. It's a band yeah, and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, if I'm playing with somebody, it's like, oh, you play me some chords. Yeah, I'll play over the yeah, top of that. But yeah. uh, I I'm not one of these guys that go, hey, play oh, me something. Oh, I don't have a lot of that solo stuff either. Yeah. People are always ask me to play solo stuff. And yeah. I. It's a different ballgame. I only isn't play it? solo stuff at home in my private room. Yeah. <laughs> As I said to you earlier, when I hear somebody play something that I can't play, man, I just feel stupid. And, uh, <laughs> well, you know, that's the way I was too. And then someone said, yeah, but you could probably do stuff he can't do. You yeah, know what exactly, I mean? Exactly, exactly. So it's, yeah. that's the way you got to look at it. You know? I think everyone has their niche thing that they do. Mm -hmm. um, being the, the studio player that, that you are, I mean, you, you can sort of fill a lot of different roles, but I know I just... I'm a rock and roll guitar player. Yeah. Um, did a record recently for a friend and she wanted to do the whole country rock thing and and that's where I suggested, hey, let's get Sean Tubbs. And I think yeah. you said you, you know of Sean. Yeah. Um, because I would just sound like a rock guy pretending. I'd be playing the right the right licks. Yeah. But it's just not the same feel. I hear guys, and a lot of those guys, I'll hear them try and play ACDC style rock. Uh -huh. okay? It's close. Yeah. It's close. You're just not... Yeah, you know, that quite thwack there. that it needs, yeah. Yeah. So come to realise you can't play yeah. everything. Well, I've, I've spent so many years in the clubs playing cover tunes, and then I would go home and I would practice my jazz and my all the other stuff. Yeah. So by the time I got to the uh, session scene, I could pretty much cover anything they threw at me, and it would sound pretty authentic, you know, because I had my R&B chops, you know. Yeah. I had all my Chuck Berry solos and uh, my B.B. King licks yep. and, and of course, all my jazz adult chords. Yep. So if I got called for a Streisand session, I could handle that too. So, yeah. it, uh, it's funny. Um, I know a couple of guys uh, who've said they've hung out with someone who I believe is quite a good friend of yours, Steve Lukather, yeah. and they all say that he's just amazing at playing 
any style. He's just like, you know, yeah, can cut it with the best of the jazz guys, cut it with the best of the the, yeah. the country guys. Is, is that true? You, you yes. sort of, yeah, yeah. I had never heard him play country, but I've heard him play some nice jazz. Yeah. And of course, his rock chops, you know, are the best. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure blues and all the other stuff he's got covered, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, around the time uh, that I, I, I was one of the first kind of young guys that got into the session scene that was versatile in that way. Uh, because now you could mention Larry Carlton, Lee Rittenauer, let's see, Dean Parks, so many, so many of the guys, they've got it all co covered these days, yeah. you know. Whereas before, when I first went there, to tell you the truth, most of the guys in that position were bebop guys. Yep. And uh, they didn't have a lot of love for for rock and stuff. Yeah. They never, you know, yeah. they never put slinky strings on and wanted yeah. to do any of that stuff they, because they were... Actually, they were they were jazz stars, you know. I mean, and that's what they should have been doing. But by that time, there wasn't any market for jazz, so they had to make a living by doing session work. Yep. Um, then when I came along and started playing Last Train to Clarksville, and then I uh, would recommend Larry, you know. We worked together a lot. And, yep. uh, Dean Parks came to town. He could cover anything. And, yep. uh, so, so you, you mentioned Larry... Larry Carlton, and we watched a, a bit of a, an interview with him uh, uh -huh. with Rick Beato the other night, and he was talking about how the way he thinks about guitar, it was all very theory, jazz, this chord implied over this one. And I, I remember turning to you going uh -huh. and saying, is this how you approach it? And you just went, yeah, no, no. How do you approach when you're playing? If you're soloing, do you sort of think of what the chords are or? Well, I always uh, know what the chords are. Are uh, I, I don't think about modes or or any of that kind of stuff, but I always it's, uh, and I think I've heard maybe Larry talk about this too. You know where your G chord is here and yep. here. Yep. Here. Yep. So when I'm soloing, uh, I know what chord I'm playing over, but I'm really just hearing a melody that comes through me and it's just home bass is that is I know I'm here and I can structure a solo that and go to the different positions yep. and then I always know I'm, where, where those different G chord inversions yep. are yep uh, and the same with all the all the different chords you, sure you, sure but um uh, other than that, I'm thinking melody. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not thinking melody. I'm, it's, it's just being created in somewhere inside my head. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I, I, I would have to say I, uh, my playing uh, somewhere, it's tied between my heart and my, my brain. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's not, uh, it's inspired. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't have a... Uh, an explanation for why I play what I play, yeah, because uh, I can't even explain it. Yeah. And if I had to stop and think about it, I couldn't even play, because it's just rolling off my fingers, you yeah. know. Would you uh, say it's a, a culmination of all your different influences all put in together? Well, it's yeah, it's all of the stuff that I've learned, uh, and yeah, and all the different uh, players. And uh, I learned. I always say I learned from the. Uh, I stole from the best. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll, similar to what Larry was saying, I know we both love Johnny Smith and learned a lot from him. Of course, Wes Montgomery, B.B. King, those guys, we learned from the same teachers, you yep. know. Yep. And uh, and they all brought something totally different. You know, Johnny Smith brought the... Uh, uh, the real, the real nice runs and a chord. You know those kind of chords. Yep. Um, you mentioned Wes, Wes, Wes Montgomery. Montgomery. I, I noticed you, you're really oh, slick with your octaves. Well, 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. You can get that from him, I take yeah. it. Yeah. It just makes the melody so much stronger when you're playing the octaves. And I've worked a lot on uh, being able to get up and down the neck of the guitar uh, and, uh, instead of just playing like in one position, yeah. you know. Uh, and, and a lot of that I got from Johnny Smith, you know. I mean, licks that I would practice in order to do that, you know. Yeah. Um, he, he did a lot of scales like... Uh, So, so trying to work out stuff in the early days when you'd hear guys playing that. Now we've got YouTube and you can watch the videos and everything. Would yeah. you just sit there with the record and That's try and... the only way we could do it yeah. back in those days. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right off of the uh, record. Yeah. You know, just putting the needle back. Oh, let me hear that one more time. Oh, yeah. 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 It's free on YouTube, man. Learn anything you want to learn yeah, there now. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the playing. There's not many guys out there that actually take advantage of that. They're all sitting there with the video games. And <laughs> <laughs> well, this is great little guitar, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to wait till you're not here. And I'm going to bash out some okay. low rock and roll styles on okay. it. <laughs> all right. So, folks, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that Louis is going to join me for a few more segments uh, over the coming months. And... Um, if you guys have any questions that you want to throw at Louis, leave them in the comments below and um, we'll get to them. I uh, we'll hope to do some some interviews, uh, all sorts of stuff. We're yeah, we talked some about some of the records that played on. Yeah, yeah. we just get together and have chat, yeah. <laughs> have coffee and just yeah. chat away. And That's it. Whatever comes out, comes out. Hopefully folks will leave us some comments below and we can answer some questions. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I just just play. I, I just love hearing you play that thing. That's... What would you say that one's worth, Rick? What's this one worth? Yeah. Ah, uh, good question. I'd say about twenty thousand. A fifty-two. Yeah. Oh, I would say it's more of thirty or forty. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Wow, that's a lot of money, isn't it? Mm-hmm.